More than 10 likes. Impressive. Hello everyone, Dante here. Thank you all for the incredible response on the video. I'm glad you all really enjoyed it. And stuff has been brought up with... Actually, hold on a minute. There, that's better. I literally figured out the issue of my audio on the final day of editing, and I wasn't going to re-record everything. Not again. Thank you all so much. I am very happy with how the video is doing. It's been a while since I've done any video editing on that scale, but I am glad with how it turned out. A lot of you also seem to like how it was edited. Thank you all very much. I will use this to fuel my narcissism. A lot of you also gave feedback, particularly involving the volume of the music. Don't worry, I will learn from this advice. That being said... Alright, I am just going to uh, add in Big Shot unedited not changing the volume anything into the timeline uh th this is big shot unedited yeah when the sky's the limit one percent is still mount everest but i will take this advice to heart in fact my next video was going to be an analysis on Ralsei. it's definitely going to be more ambitious so i wanted to take my time with it and then this happened. Oh hey, Misty Sparkles uploaded a sequel to the Gaster video. So, not a lot to go on, but I should have mentioned it. Oh, you gotta be fuck- I am the king and slash or bastard of good or bad timing. I finish recording audio when Halfbred Chaos uploads the December holiday video, then the Gaster follow-up uploads a couple of days afterwards. No fault to both of them, I just find this very, very funny. Like, what's next? Deltarune Chapter 3 and 4 release a week after I upload this video? But yeah, let's talk about Dr. Garlic over here once again. So... Yeah, that song playing in the ocean also has its ties to Undertale when the Riverman also mentions of a melody. I also forgot to mention how Onion says the song itself isn't just a new song, for they have heard it before. It's only a piece of a song, just a small portion of a whole, a fragment, scattered away. I wonder what it could mean. It's Gaster. Yeah, we all know where this was going. There really isn't much to point to other than my good friend Walter Gooseman over here. Listen, I try to focus on the details that we know are in the text of the story. I don't want to point to everything and claim that it's the Fortnite man behind it all. But, listen, we all gotta pull the band-aid off at some point. This is a gasterism. There's even more to this than just these two pieces of dialogue. Thank you, Ivy Thay, 4,259th of your name, for putting this out in the comments, but in Undertale, the mythological sound test room can be reached and achieved by walking between these two rooms, one of which has a very big view of a very big body of water. I know it's a river, don't at me. The sound test room is where we get access to Gaster's theme. It all comes back to that guy. Alright, I've done my legally mandated discussion of Gaster. Let's talk about something else. Caddy. I've talked about her for one second in my previous video, but that's mainly because it was getting long. Now though, I can talk about her all I want. Alright, first off, we all agree she's going to be a major character, right? Her and Jockey for sure, but her in particular. Why do I say that? Well, well, for starters, she has a portrait, but also due to the fact that she and Chris do have some sort of friendship that extends before the start of the game. Both of them studied the occult together, and while dialogue like this further emphasizes Chris's personality and interests, them being interested in magic, 
There are also some darker implications. I'm not the first one to point out all of the religious connotations the game has. Banishing the angels heaven, Spamthing calling out for heaven, the whole angel worship, and as well as heavenly light healing people. Not to say that occultism is inherently demonic, trust me I've done my research on the subject, but all of this seems to bolster the otherness Chris gives off. Being called a Lightbringer by King, wearing red horns as a kid, and the fact that us and their connection can be read as a metaphor for... <laughs> demonic possession. But back to Caddy. For someone being a goth who barely speaks, she seems to have a very social life. She and Chris used to be study buddies, her and Jockington are besties, Hell, she even taught Noelle protection spells. Not to mention Susie either. She and Chris have some sense of camaraderie and the feeling of admiration towards Noelle. Caddy freaking hates Susie. This doesn't even feel like the same dislike that people generally give Susie, mainly behind uh, misunderstandings. Caddy just really does not like Susie. Susie says it's because she took Joggington's hat once, but I feel like there's more to this than just that. Caddy sees Susie as a dark presence, a genuine danger, and she asks Chris to protect Noelle because we walk among the dark, and she fears that Noelle might end up slipping down the dark. Conversations like this really do make us think about how the game will progress. Does this line exist simply to show Caddy's development, showing her opinion has changed over time for the start? Maybe she'll warm up to Susie later? Or is this line a genuine warning for Susie? Because we still only got a small portion of the game. There are things that can happen that will permanently change the, how a character is. Plus, Susie isn't really a paragon of virtue either. She was a genuine bully to Chris, and while things have changed, they also have time to change again. And while she may be good intention now, there's still a chance that she can do a great deal of damage in the future. But there's also the matter of Noelle. She's supposed to be the good girl, high up in the heavens like an angel. She isn't supposed to fall. But if she does... How far will she fall? Thank you for the consideration, Caddy. I can understand why you want to protect Noelle. Susie's not the one you should be worried about, though. Anyway, that's it. Thank you for pointing these out. Uh, Caddy and Onion, those were the two pressing matters to discuss. I believe I talked about everything I needed to. There's definitely nothing else important that I need to... Ah, who could forget about him? Alright, alright. I'll play along with this game. Let's all talk about good old Chucky Freezes. So, what is there to discuss about good old Isaac Entertainment over here? Well, more than there should be, to be honest. For context, in Undertale, I see is just a simple joke that has one appearance showing up at a crossword puzzle and then never appearing again. Just a small and minor detail, big wolf. In Deltarune, however, icy sightings have increased tenfold. Icy is the mascot. Step inside Friedrich Polar Bear's Pezzeria. Look him up online. There's a huge and major discussion on the existence of Issa's eye, be it mascot, cryptid, or just straight up this dude ass guy. Why is this all important? That's a very good question. Why is Ices, of all things, given this much attention? Why does he keep showing up? Not even in the games. Why is he in the Spang Tonk sweepstake? Why does this keep happening? I thought it was just a joke at first, but the more and more he props up, the less I think it's a joke. Out of all of the things I pointed out as possible Chekhov's gun, this one, I hope, remains untouched. I feel fear whenever I think of Ices, because logically, this is just a joke that's building up to something, but ultimately a joke. Then I remember Deltarune's ending was formed off of a fever dream Toby had in 2011. Okay, I'm going to stop talking about Ices now. I'm going to stop thinking 
about icy snow. I am actively electing to deny the existence of the frozen vowel. Hello everyone, Dante here. I am recording this in an undisclosed location, so sorry for the mic quality, and I was just hit with a divine revelation that can only come at 5am and 4 bottles of Baja Blast, but I figured out the truth. Ices is a corrupted game file. The first sighting of Ices is a crossword puzzle, but there is a fun value event that causes the addition of a snowman with Ices face on it, also called Nightmare. This, this is the first instance of corruption. Going forward, we have IC being a stand-in for a cash grab corporation with unethical worth ethic. Corporate corruption, all while they sell you slop to consume. Next, we have a glitch in the game that comes whenever Chris types Gyatsubeth ever. You see this, you see what this is all is pointing to, right? Cryptid, costume, construct. All of these points to desire of Ices to spread and corrupt all tangential instances into an aspect of itself, putting its face on it and spreading more and more. Ices is a corrupted glitch in a program that is slowly piling up and consuming all other lines of text, linking memory, and becoming a completely unrecognizable slop, just like its pizzas. Ices is a danger to Dunk Rune, all he wants is to consume, corrupt, conquer, consume, corrupt, and conquer all of the game until it's nothing but Ices. We need to stop the spread of Ices, everyone. Stop talking about Ices. It's only creating spores to the wind. Wow, I have no memory of recording that. Let's instead talk about something good. Hey, remember the thrash machine? Me too. Oh, I love it. Let's talk about this once more. Ah, wow, so cool. Awesome boss fight. Amazing execution. I just love this moment of the game. It really is awesome that Toby allowed us to customize an aspect of the game and fully allowed us to do something with it in a major climactic moment of the story, even though we thought it was gone forever. It's great. It's amazing. I wish something like this happens again. Hey, wait a minute. So, shout out to Ungle Spungle and Enter Valentine 9588 for pointing this out, but I'm surprised I never thought about it. The Goner sequence and the Thrash Machine are basically the same. I'm not even talking about them being very similar to each other, they are literally the same. We design the features, it gets displayed to us, and we are led to believe it just disappears. The duck, however, came back, which leads to the logical conclusion that the goner will also come back. This, this right here, this isn't even Chekhov's gun. This is Chekhov's artillery cannon. <laughs> Plus, what's more is that we're supposed to fight the thrash machine, but we end up controlling it. And the goner was something we made for the intent of controlling, which leads to... Well, let's just hope you didn't choose pain as your favorite flavor. God, this game is filled to the brim with bullets. Sifting through each and every one of them is pretty much a Sisyphean task. At least we know when something is major and important, which this video is not about. I specifically made a point about how I want to focus on the smaller things people have missed. And then there are things that I just don't have an answer to. What do you mean the contents of the store change based on the save file? What do you mean this is the only instance this happens? Then there's just the ever-present feeling that I'm just focusing on something that's not really important and doesn't really matter to the main story. Like an old man yelling at clouds. But, yeah. I just want to thank you all once again for the response of my last video. You all gave great comments, pointing out things that I never noticed and adding to things that you think are important. 
and especially elaborating on certain points, like for Susie and how she can heal. Cal the Untitled pointed out a comment that Toby made before Chapter 2 came out. I was going to give a certain character a fire spell, but decided against it for the first chapter. As for what I'm looking forward to, well, it's hard to describe this without spoiling anything, but a certain character will learn a certain type of spell that they aren't really good at. Actually, they're so bad, there's essentially no reason to have them use it at first, but the fact that they had learned it and keep practicing is really heartwarming. Hmm. A certain Chapter 1 character learning fire magic while Susie is learning healing spells. This is something to think about. Which I find neat. While Susie is pretty bad at it, we can actually increase her healing potential. I am, however, interested in how this continues in the future. I also wanted to bring back that comment Ender Valentine made. I feel like the purpose of Susie he learning healing magic is to symbolize her becoming more vulnerable and showing her softer side, since the only other spells that she knows is Rude or Red Buster, a big attack. I feel when you try to get into theorizing, you tend to forget that not everything has to fit in an overarching plot or lore. Undertale and Deltarune, it's very character focused, in my opinion. It's probably nothing to worry about. That is a great point. Susie learning healing magic is absolutely a major character moment for Susie, learning to show compassion and kindness. It's great for her. We love to see it. That being said, that being said, I don't fully agree with you, and sorry for putting you in particular on blast, I just think there is something that you are missing. Something that everybody is missing. Like I said before, I wanted to focus on the lesser talked about points of interest, and not dwell on the already big plot points. So I didn't think about talking about this because it was obviously big, but the more I think about it, the more I think that some people have just forgotten about it. Something that should be the focal point of everything. Something that is foundational to Deltarune. The first thing you hear Rousey tell you, the first thing you see when the start of the game, it's even one of the earliest things on the Deltarune website, archived for everyone to find. Three heroes appear to banish the angel's heaven. Every other point I have talked about can be debated, but if there is one thing we know is important, if there is one thing we know that is integral to Deltarune, it's the legend. But Deltarune has a habit of setting something to go in a certain direction, only to then go somewhere you didn't think of. So, it's really a question of how the legend will play out. Will we walk the pre-designated path and achieve the soul ending? Or... Will we forge a new one ourselves? But that's all I have to say for now. Thank you all very much for reaching this point. This is the part where I tell you to like and subscribe, but I'm not going to do that. Thank you all very much, and I'll see you next time.